Now we know how to calculate the diffracted power. That's the key part. Okay. So in the procedure first, we have to calculate the power that you would get if you had a free link. Okay, so the normal freeze freeze phase equation. Okay, you use to calculate. Then you determine this G. Okay, from I mean, then you first you determine this value, uh, Fresnel Kirchhoff diffraction parameter. From there, this graph can give you G. Okay, so you can get PR. And we also know that uh, G can be positive or negative. Okay, uh, and uh, we also discussed that there there's a set of approximate relationships. Okay, Re relationships between Fresnel Kirchhoff diffraction parameter and G. Okay, one last thing here that when you uh, calculate H, which is a parameter, do you hear me, guys? Guys, do you do you hear me? Hello, guys. Uh, yes, sir. Is we can. Sound clear? Okay, thank you. Thank you. If it is not, uh, because I am using a yes. new connection, the hospital Wi-Fi. Uh, I don't know how it would work. If it doesn't work well, I would switch to mobile data. Okay. Uh, so, in the uh, when you calculate the Fresnel diffraction parameter, this gamma uh, is a function of h. Okay. And uh, so, I mean, you must uh, know h for your particular case. And there is the height of the obstacle above the line connecting the transmitter and the receiver. But you see that you have some inclinations here and you don't have the perfect angles, perfect right angles. So what do you do at the time of the exam? Let's use some approximation. You go this way. Uh, you uh, just assume here this part to be H, which is the summation of HR plus h prime um well um i mean um, h r plus h prime plus your h okay that you want to calculate would give you the total height of the obstacle okay so h you determine subtracting h prime and h r from the obstacle height but what do we mean by h prime h okay let's assume that you create a triangle here Okay, just assume triangle, both of which are right angle. I mean, triangles with right angles. You you have right angle here, right angle. Okay, and also the distances you have here d1 and d d2 uh, takes uh, the basis. Okay, so basically for the large triangle, the whole base is d1 plus d2, and uh, this arm is h2 minus hr. Okay, so H2 minus HR uh, and the base is D1 plus D2. For this small triangle here, H prime, okay, uh, we just assume it to be to to be vertical, uh, to be normal, okay, completely normal. You have a right, creating right angle. So uh, on this side you have H prime, and on the base side you have now D2. So for with this simple assumption, is two minus h r and uh, when ratioed with d one plus d two must be equal to h prime ratioed with d two. Okay, from this relationship you can determine h prime. Okay, it should be h prime actually. H prime. Okay, so once you determine h prime, I mean, uh, if you have having said that h r is given and all these values are also given. Okay, so you can calculate H prime and then so you can calculate H. So this is the part of the obstacle above the line connecting the transmitter and the receiver. So use this approximation at the time of the exam. Okay, when you work out problems at the time of the exam, you can use this simplicity. Any questions? If not, we'll move to the next part. 
last couple of pages again uh, uses something uh, related to uh, diffraction. See, there is something called Fresnel Jones. It defines actually a particular uh, area, uh, but that definition comes, um, I mean, is based on diffraction. Let's assume that you have uh, an obstacle here, okay, between, I mean, these two points and the end points uh, where you see the white arrows, okay, we have the transmitter and the receiver. So you have some obstacle on the way and the edge, okay. By the way, it is sometimes called knife edge, okay. The way we are showing uh, is often called knife edge. So you again have some edge here, so that would cause a diffracted ray, okay. Now, the if you had a clear path, you, you would uh, have a, I mean, total distance for the free link D, okay. So the free ray would take a path D. And when you take, uh, I mean, if you have both, if you have this direct ray and the diffracted ray, then of course the diffracted ray has a longer path and that path difference, okay, does matter. Because if you have both of them, then the phase difference depends on the path difference. We discussed it before also. I'll go back to this relationship, okay, to, to discuss this thing. But here you see that there would be, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the some phase difference and that tells you what the resultant would be. If you have say completely 180 degree out of phase, okay, then, the, I mean, a smaller one will be just subtracted from the larger one. So that is destructive. Uh, on the other hand, if you have them zero degree or 360 degree, uh, zero degree, in, I mean, in phase, then they will be additive, okay. So what you can do, uh, I mean, in, in terms of actually uh, some path length, we actually determine, we can determine how much uh, would be the phase difference. We know that if the path difference here is lambda by two for the orange one, okay, compared to the black ray, if the path length, if the additional path is lambda by two, then the phase difference would be pi, would be pi or 180 degree, okay. But that actually requires certain height here, the defined certain height. If we consider the middle point, there is certain height which would give you this lambda by two. Again, for of course that depends on lambda, that depends on the distance. Uh, anyway, so you have a certain height for which you'd again consider the green line, the path difference would equal to lambda. So that in that case, you have a phase difference, another 180 degrees. So that's actually, it will become in phase. Another ray, cons I mean height you consider, which uh, causes a diffracted ray blue color. So that would give you three lambda by two extra path. So, so again, you get another 180 degree. This, this time it will be destructive. So as you create new heights, there will be um, I mean, diffracted rays, new diffracted rays, either 180 degree. Okay, so just considering this particular levels where you have completely 180 degree out of phase or in phase, completely in phase um, conditions. So, so this will, these particular height levels, if we consider uh, at this, at the middle point, okay, between the transmitter and the receiver, uh, we can actually consider it in all different directions. Maybe you are considering so far, uh, it, uh, I mean, consider it a point right above the earth. I mean, so 90 degree, at a 90 degree vertical position. But now vertically, if, if you shift the, the angle, 
So again, actually there'll be another point giving you the same, same path difference. Well, so that way you can actually get some circle, circle. So this circle, although I mean, it is shown, drawn here. I mean, actually the orange, the green or the blue circles, they are shown, they, I mean, they are to be shown on a plane vertical to our screen. Okay, I mean, but that's not possible. We have a 2D plane here in the, on the display. So it is drawn this way, but actually they are meant to be some circles, some circles around the middle point. Okay, because I mean, any point on this circle would give you the same path difference. It would give you the same path difference, okay? So if you have a direct ray, then this diffracted rays can give you some I mean, complete destruction or addition, okay? So this, uh, they are meaningful, this uh, circle radii, the radii of all these circles are meaningful because a diffracted ray, diffracted edge at this radii can cause some um, perfect addition or perfect sub subtraction, perfect distraction. So this radii, all these radii are meaningful. That's how we define the, the Fresnel Jones. Fresnel Jones are actually, I mean, the way we have considered so far, they are just circles with certain radius. The first one is called the first Fresnel Jones. And its radius, you know, you can actually calculate. If you know the distance, if you know the lambda, you can calculate the radius of the first Fresnel Jones. The green one gives you the second Fresnel Jones. The, the blue one, the third Fresnel Jones. So this is on and on. You have different Fresnel Jones with different numbers. But the first Fresnel Jones, remember, that creates an additional path of lambda by two as marked here in, I mean, written down in orange, D plus lambda by two. The green one, lambda by plus D, blue, I mean, D plus, D plus lambda, D plus three lambda by four, of course, the fourth one would be D plus twice lambda. On and on. So this way you have some Fresnel Jones. Okay. Now is it is it clear so far, guys? Is it clear so far? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is clear, okay. Sir. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Okay. Now one step more. We would go ahead another step. If you now keep moving from the middle point, okay? If you go towards the transmitter, the height, and again, for say at another point, but now a little closer to transmitter, instead of the middle point, you get a little closer to the transmitter. Again, you start calculating the circles, okay? The radii for all these Fresnel Jones, Fresnel Jones, I mean, first, second, third Fresnel Jones. What do you think? Would you, would the, radii be the same as you had at the middle? I mean, intuitively, apply your intuition. Actually, you know the circles, uh, I mean, triangles, uh, probably you have the, the, see the total path, okay? We are considering fixed for the orange one. The total path is just lambda by two larger than D, okay? So it has, a, it has some fixed, uh, fixed path. The total path is fixed. So that length, if you keep that length fixed and then start moving towards any direction, transmit on the receiver, the height that makes the same uh, same path length, okay, would be actually smaller. As, as you go towards transmitter and the receiver, it would be smaller. I mean, we're not showing the geometric proof how it would vary, but in fact, it would take the, I mean, it would get uh, smaller in the form of an ellipsoid. See, we had actually a circle and in, the whole circle 
could get smaller gradually as you go towards the transmitter or the receiver. It would start um, uh, getting smaller, small for each for any of the circles. The size will change. They would get smaller. How? They would get the form. I mean, it would be like a, uh, like the form of ellip ellipse. Because in the case of ellipse, from this foci, if you from any point, if you can recall okay, the geometry for an ellipse, for for an ellipse from the, I mean, from any point, the distance. The total distance, the distance uh, of the foci between the, that point and the foci for the two sides, become, when you sum up, it is equal at all points on the uh, line. So that's how it is created. So we actually get uh, a form of ellipse, but in this case, it is uh, it's a three-dimensional ellipse, which is what is called ellipsoid. So you actually get the form of ellipsoid. Of course, it, it makes no sense beyond the transmitter and the receiver points. Okay. It's meaningful until, I mean, the, the whole ellipsoid, ellipsoids are drawn here. But for our communication link, it is uh, meaningful only up to this range of D. Okay. But, but these circles uh, are reshaped as you move towards any direction, and uh, you, it gives you the form of ellipsoid. So, like like the watermelons. Okay. Well, is it now clear? Is it clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, but why you need that? Well, it is just uh, an idea. This first, second, of, I mean, different Fresnel zones are some idea for the RF engineers. How uh, different obstacles um, you have on the way. Okay. So in terms of the Fresnel zones, it may be uh, stated. Okay. Most commonly, people use the first Fresnel zone. And uh, a lot, of, I mean, most commonly people use it for the LOS link. See, for an LOS link, the signal propagates. It, the e electromagnetic wave, it's, um, you know, you have the field content carrying the power. Now, when you have the direct link, okay, the, I mean, LOS link. You cannot, if you have a small hole, okay, on the way, the hole, I mean, maybe you say you, you create a, I mean, there is a, uh, just assume that you have a large building on the way, okay? And then, or, or a large wall, obstacle, as an obstacle. Then on the wall, you create a very small hole at a place that can connect the transmitter and the receiver. Just a small hole, maybe one inch dia hole. You create on the wall, but the position of the hole um, is such that the center of the hole is actually the line that connects the transmitter and the receiver. What do you think? You'd get good power at the reception? Just, I mean, you have a very, narrow hole okay so you you still have a i mean direct link you can say that uh, well it is an LOS link it is possible that you you can see the other end there is a clear you can draw a line you can draw a straight line between the transmitter and the receiver it will go through the hole okay without hitting anything but but Practically, the power flow uh, requires some space. This small hole is, is not sufficient. You have some electromagnetic wave. It's actually, a, I mean, an electro, the, the field 
the, the field takes some space as it propagates containing power. So the whole thing, it depends on the field distribution, but you, I mean, you don't define it, I mean, that way. And uh, it depends on the radiation pattern, of course, from the antenna. But in the case of LOS link, uh, it is never like that a small hole, whatever your uh, radiation pattern is, no matter how directional it is, a small hole is not sufficient. You actually need some space for the power to flow. But how much that is? So, so meaning that if you have some obstacle on the way, that obstacle uh, and you to create an LOS link above the obstacle, maybe you have some uh, say 10 storied building between the transmitter and the receiver. So you uh, to create an LOS link, you need to raise the heights of the towers. I got lost. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Do you hear me now? Hello? Hello, do you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. So I'm sorry I'm getting uh, interrupted. Okay. No um, problem, sir. Now yes, let's, sir. let's assume Fine, sir. that you have a 10 storied building and you want to create uh, on the, I mean, between the transmitter and the receiver and you have transmitter and the receiver towers. Uh, so as an engineer, you need to use tower heights uh, as much as you need, because if you use tire high, a tower height higher than necessity, necessity, then you are actually wasting money. Okay, it should be barely enough. Uh, so, but what your necessity is, how you can determine? Is it like just you have ten feet building, hundred feet building? Is it like hundred feet and six inch? Is it enough? No, it is not. The, with 100 feet and six inches tower heights on the two sides, you can draw a line, a straight line. You can do that, I agree. But actually the power flow, the field that flows with the whole power requires some space, okay? The propagation of the wave requires some space. Yeah, it depends on the, uh, beam width of the antenna, but anyway, you need actually significant space. And that space is defined uh, a lot of times in a way that for the first Fresnel zone, 60% should be clear. So your obstacle must not cover more than 40% of your first Fresnel zone. Let's go back to the Fresnel zone figure probably you can now visualize the Fresnel zone gives you actually the first Fresnel zone tells you how your space uh, is between the between the link okay how much space you have around so the I mean the whole space the whole first Fresnel zone you don't need for the wave to propagate but at least I mean not more than if you have some obstacle Okay, from the ground you have some obstacle. It if you if you cover um, you shouldn't cover more than forty percent. I mean, you should have more than sixty percent, at least sixty percent of the first presidential free. That can uh, cause uh, an effective LOS link. Okay, sometimes per it is uh, considered fifty five percent, fifty five or sixty percent of the first presidential. Uh, should be made clear, okay. But if you make it, uh, but you can, um, uh, I mean, use even higher tower heights, creating say 80% of the 80% clear, uh, clear Fresnel zone, okay. The 80% of the first Fresnel zone is made clear. 
So that would unnecessarily increase the cost on the towers. Okay. When you when you have sixty percent clear, it's good enough. Don't waste money for further clearance. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, so the path difference uh, comes into role sometimes. Okay. Uh, and here also, even for this particular case, we could uh, write down an expression for the path difference, the phase difference. Okay, and well, for the path difference, actually, we wrote down. Uh, if you want to write down uh, the equation for phase difference, we know from our previous derivation, the phase difference is 2 pi del by lambda. And for del, we had this expression. So that if you put here, uh, then a bit manipulate, okay, by two, and here after, I mean you get, I mean just uh, put, write it down this way. Use two here and again two. Okay, then what you can see that you actually this term, this term becomes a square of uh, new. Okay, or the phase difference is pi by two multiplied by the square of Fresnel Karshov diffraction parameter. Okay. Okay. Uh, here also we can uh, actually have some identity. The see the path difference. We know that as this expression, okay. But here for the when the path difference uh, applies to a Fresnel John case, okay. For the first or the second, so the first Fresnel. I mean they are just numbered. So n gives you the number. n equals to one means first Fresnel zone. n equals to the second Fresnel. So for the first Fresnel zone, we know that it is the path difference is lambda by two. So the path difference is always n times lambda by two. Num number of Fresnel zone times lambda by two. Okay. And our h, okay, if you consider. I mean, this one as the obstacle height causing the diffracted ray. Then uh, this height, okay, is actually what we have above the line connecting the transmitter and the receiver. So it is our H. And that's the radius of our uh, Fresnel zone. So H is nothing but Fresnel zone. So when you are considering n number Fresnel zone, then that is this h is our r n radius for n number Fresnel zone. Okay. So I mean we can rearrange. I mean well I mean first of all this is our path difference, and for Fresnel zone we know that the path difference is n times lambda by two, so we can equate. And here h is nothing but r n radius for n number Fresnel zone, so that we can write down this way. Okay, so that is pretty much about Fresnel zone questions. So you can you can calculate if I ask you to calculate, you can do that using these relationships. Okay. Questions? Okay, uh, we had uh, four different mechanisms for non LS communication. We are left with scattering. Uh, this one, let's uh, let me little reshuffle. Uh, we have our subsequent topic is fading, so let me discuss fading first, and later scattering because fading is included in the midterm ex exam. I need to finish fading. If time scattering permits, is not involved, sir, scattering huh? is not included. If time permits, I'll cover scattering and I'll include that too. Okay. So, but I got to include fading. Uh, okay. So let me make sure that I can finish that. Okay. 
I believe I can finish after it's uh, fading. I can discuss scattering, but just to be on the safe side. Okay. Uh, sorry, you may be overhearing my mom. I mean, she's speaking. She's on the other side. I mean, uh, I'm on the guest side. She's on the patient side. Okay. Uh, the term fading, you all know that when something is weakened or attenuated, we call it fading. I mean, it's faded. Okay. Uh, now, in the in this case, we have we mean in wireless communication, we I mean mean fading almost the same way, but sometimes it can mean even some increase. It can be some fluctuations. Okay. See, when you have some uh, non-LOS communication, the signal gets to the receiver via many different paths. Just if you have a small impulse, I mean, just a, just an impulse, okay? Not impulse, I mean the ideal impulse, okay? Just an impulse is sent from the transmitter. At the receiver, you will get different versions of the impulse. Maybe a direct link is there, so you get a get an impulse via the direct link. So there can be reflection from some building, another impulse you get. Another building you have on the on another side, that will cause another reflected ray. There can be some diffracted ray, there can be some scattered, okay, penetrating through some obstacles. So there in via many different paths, you are getting many different versions of the same impulse. So you, you actually get the signal via many different paths in non-LS environment. So your environment is, uh, has multiple paths and it is called multi-path environment. That's the very special feature. It is multi-path environment, causing many different versions of the signal. Secondly, the different paths in the multi-path environment, okay, so multiple versions of the transmission signal. So these, these many different versions uh, are, I mean, they dif uh, have different delays on the way they take different um, actually time periods to get to the rece receiver because the path lens we are already familiar the, with the bad difference i mean uh, it causes different time for the signal to arrive and also it ch ch i mean uh, causes different phase for this version, okay. So different timing and different phase. With that, that version arrives at the receiver. So different, say if you are, if you have a reflected, you may have a large building with very good reflector uh, surface, okay. But at quite a bit of distance, it's not very close then there can be a significant i mean there can be a reflected ray with significant power content because it's a large reflector with good reflection property so the reflected ray will arrive at the receiver with good power content however it will be too delayed because it has to cover a very long distance it has to get to that reflector i say that it is located sort of a bit far. So it has to get there and then come back to the receiver. So on both sides of the path, on the on the both uh, parts of the path, it is traversing a lot more. So it will be 
it, it, it can be too much delayed. So the delay can be a lot sometimes, but you cannot ignore if it comes with good power content. So the multipath environment uh, can uh, makes the uh, makes the actual communication path very complex, and uh, there is no good way to actually ignore a lot of things. I mean, you you approximate, but not many things you can approximate because a delayed component can arrive with very good power level. Then you cannot ignore. Okay. So you have to actually incorporate these facts, and that's how you have to design. You have to work with with all these phenomena. Now, uh, so multipath waves. So we have we are will be so from now on. Okay, I mean for this non LS environment, we'll be considering multipath signals. Signals arriving the receiver arriving uh, via multiple paths. Okay. No, uh, well, uh, okay, we'll come back to this figure later. Now, these uh, different versions, okay, since they arrive at different time instants, okay, because they need different, uh, different time to get to the receiver, different time for propagation. So they have different delays. Now we are considering so one impulse you send to the receiver, just an impulse you have transmitted. That impulse arrives at different delays in the receiver, and that is shown here. So, I mean, the reference, the first version you receive is shown to be at the reference point in the time, the, time, the horizontal axis is the time axis, and the second component, let's assume, is one microsecond delayed. Then the third component is three microsecond. Okay, so different versions. But it's very important how much power content you have for these different versions, because that way it will affect the resultant. Okay, if it is very low power uh, con content, then it will not actually. I mean, you can even ignore it. So uh, the power content is important, power levels, and how much delayed they are. So that's how you, you actually can uh, characterize the whole multipath environment. It's a, now, this way, you are characterizing the multipath environment. Okay, Not exactly. I mean, this, is, this way, we are not uh, clearly depicting how you receive. Okay. How the signal quality is that that part we we discuss, but for now look at this figure. It's actually defining the characteristics of the environment. That's taking the signal to the receiver. Okay. It's all giving you the property of the multipath environment. It's showing that you may have some reflector or defra diffracting edge, okay, causing you this uh, high power content uh, signals at this much delays. So their location, it, it depends on the location of the receivers. So the whole multipath environment is defined by the by this figure. So this is called, this figure is called power delay profile, PDP, power delay profile, where different power levels uh, are shown uh, to be located at their respective delays. Got it? It's called power delay profile. Uh, also, we should note that this is dispersing our uh, transmission. So we actually said, um, if we had just a single ray, just the direct ray, we'd get a single version at at the same time constant. Okay, if you even if you have two different versions arriving at the same time, then at the receiving receiving end, the transmitted component is is located at the same moment. Okay, at the same moment you're receiving all different versions, but that's not the case. You're receiving at many different moments. So, in the time domain, 
the component is dispersed. It is uh, scattered or dispersed at different time instance you were receiving the, I mean, different versions of the same transmitted signal. So this is called uh, time dispersion, okay? And this causes some fading effect that we'll consider now. For now, let's assume that our multipath environment is static, meaning that we have, of course, a multipath complex multipath uh, environment causing many different paths for the signal, but the whole multipath environment is not changing in time. Okay, it's not time varying. The whole multipath channel is not time varying. For now, we'd consider it like this. So our present topic is fading due to time dispersion. And this time we'll cause consider multipath channel. Okay. Multipath environment is taking you the signal to the receiver. So we'll call it multipath channel. It's not time varying. Shortly we'll see that it will cause a type of fading that we can consider in the frequency domain to be very selective. Okay. So we will then be able to explain that it is a type of frequency selective fading. So fading due to time dispersion will be equivalent to frequency selective fading. But there is a counterpart of this whole thing. And that will be the second part of the discussion. So after I complete this part, let me just show you what we will discuss then. After this is the this is the first part. Okay. So the counterpart has opposite terms. You see that is fading due to frequency dispersion. Previously, we had time dispersion, which caused frequency selective fading. But this time, we are you can see that it's fading due to frequency dispersion, and it's causing time selective fading. Okay, it's, so it's just the other way around. Now we have frequency dispersion causing time selective fading. Okay. And in the second part, we'd consider the multipath channel to be time varying. The multipath channel is varying with time. Okay. I mean, there can be even fast variation. Okay. The, this effect, this fading effect depends on, depends on how fast the multipath channel varies. Okay. So the first part. The PDP. Uh, is gives you the property of the environment, I said. Uh, but this type of figure uh, cannot summarize. Okay, so as an RF engineer, you may want to compare different environments, say an environment of urban area, particular urban area, say Tokyo or New York. <clears throat> you wanna compare with some rural, rural area. So some rural areas in Bangladesh. So they would have completely different types of power delay profile. If you test, people do this type of test a lot. If you do it, uh, I mean, in an urban area, there'll be large reflectors. So there'll be many different components with large power content. But in rural environment, okay, you have, you have very, I mean, uh, I mean, few components with, with uh, little power because some is scattering from foliage or some maybe uh, give you some extra signal components. Okay. But also the, the large reflectors, okay, the downtown areas, so they would have different properties. And how closely they are located, the density when you are in downtown area, then the, the I mean, reflect components will be very close. The delays will not be much because the buildings are closed, okay? So the type of urban area, the type of, I mean, suburban area, okay, many different areas would have been. So we need to characterize because we have to fit the operation in a particular environment. Uh, now, so to define it uh, in a more concise term, something called delay spread is used. There are actually two terms, main excess delay, I mean, mean excess delay and RMS delay spread. The second term, RMS delay spread, is also called delay spread in short. Very simple. I mean, I mean, it might have been sounding very high 
but the calculations will be very simple. If I give you this PDP in the exam, okay, you can calculate these terms very easily. See, for each of the terms, take the delay, which is tau here, multiply with the power. So like here, say for the first component, the delay is zero. So that will actually vanish the term. For the second component, it is one. And the power, count, it, is, it should be dBm. They all should be dBm here. Uh, the power content is uh, one milliwatt. When you convert to dBm, it is zero, one milliwatt because it's log. If you take log of one, it becomes zero. So you have actually one milliwatt. So you need to take one, one, multiply by one. Then for the second point, actually, I mean, there is nothing here. Then the next term is minus 30 dB, three. So minus 30 means 0 0.001. Minus 30 means 0 0.001 milliwatt. So I mean, one plus into one plus three into, you sum up all, all these components, three into 0 0.001. So on and on, then plus four into one. So this way you calculate. By the way, you can actually quickly convert to the real, real power from dB values uh, using a trick. The trick is divide it by 10, then put the term as a power of 10. Like you have here minus 30. When you divide by 10, you get minus three. Divide minus 30 by 10, minus three. Then use this minus three as the power of 10. 10 to the power minus three. That's 0 0.001. So you actually have 0 0.001 milliwatt here. Okay. So the, I mean, these products you sum up uh, for the denominator, and in the denominator you sum up all the power contents, including for, including the first one, which vanished in the denominator, but in the denominator it will impact. So just sum up all the power values. So here 0.1. 1, 0 0.001, okay, here 0 0.01, so sum up all, all of them, so that the denominator, so it's, it's called the mean axis delay, so it gives you an overall idea about how you have different power delay, power components scattered or dispersed in time, okay, but more commonly people use the term R, uh, RMS delay, so that gives you better reflection, okay, commonly called only delay speed. How you calculate? Well, for, I mean, you need here mean excess delay, and you take it is take its square. Also, you take tau square. Okay, what that is, and then subtract and to take root. Okay, so what that is? This tau square, tau square, and then average. That is like just like this way you calculate, but instead of tau, you take tau square. Okay, using tau square for every product, you calculate okay. all these products, then you sum up, okay, so, so that is tau square average. So of course, this term would be ha larger than this one because it is squaring. So then divide, um, uh, subtract and then take root. So that is called delay spread, okay. So commonly people use delay spread to characterize a particular term. Okay, so now we understand that there is time dispersion. Now we gotta, we need to understand whether this time dispersion is good for us or it is not. Well, the answer is, it is, it is, uh, it's a problem usually, but sometimes you can take its, you can take an advantage of it. Okay, you have some complexity that you need to address because of this time dispersion. But if you can tackle well, then you have some benefit. Well, how we get the benefit? Well, the, I mean, a very good uh, way to take advantage of it, to tackle it well, 
is the use of rake receiver. Well, all receivers actually, I mean, combine much of this, much of these different components. Okay. But the rake receiver can do it uh, in a very smart way. It uses several sub receivers. And these sub receivers capture, I mean, they work at different time instants. They capture different components and then sum up. So the receiver, I mean, has a combination of, so Qualcomm invented this rake receiver. And uh, I mean, this, these uh, components are also called fingers at the receiving end. Okay. So in, uh, the early uh, Qualcomm uh, phones or developments had eight, uh, the capacity to capture eight fingers. The rake receivers could capture up to eight, eight fingers. Okay, later they upgraded it uh, and the newer uh, phones could capture 12 fingers. Okay. I actually saw them uh, uh, at Qualcomm that uh, how, uh, I mean, the display of the, of the equipment is showing that uh, the different fingers are, are arriving at, okay, and the receiver is actually capturing. And the receiver, uh, I mean, these are the, this, I mean, the display, uh, the equipment is to show what uh, fingers the rake receiver has captured. Okay, so many different components. So up to eight fingers or up to 12 fingers, it, it can capture, okay. So when I saw them, they had, they already had 12 fingers capability, I think. I don't remember exactly, okay. And they have, Qualcomm has their uh, headquarter in San Diego. So I was there then. Okay, now, in basically this time dispersion is a problem, is a great problem for us. The key reason is it causes intersymbol interference, which we already explained. You know what it is. When yes. you have, when you have uh, different versions arriving, this, this, you're sending a symbol but the symbol is arriving with different versions at different times, okay. Then actually it would overlap with another symbol because you are sending symbols one after another. It's a, I mean, when you transmit, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a stream of symbols, okay. In the communication link, you keep sending symbols one after another. There is no gap between the, I mean, there is gap. I mean, that is, uh, you know, I mean, uh, there's a gap within its, within its definition. We'll show you later that there are some time, uh, there's some guard, guard uh, period, okay, for any symbol. You have some guard periods there. Uh, but as a whole, you consider, you, you, I mean, the guard peers are, of course, small, uh, but as, a, I mean, uh, well, I mean, as a whole, you can, you consider the symbols to be, to be transmitted one after another, okay. BT stream, the BT stream, you consider that symbols are transmitted one after another, okay. I mean, I mean, the, 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 in the delays or whatever the gaps, I mean, these are just negligible. You have actually symbols. You should consider always symbols one after another without any delay you're sending. So when, if a particular symbol is delayed, it will overlap the next symbol, okay? Which may, whose, a version has already arrived. So many different, for each of the symbol, many different versions are arriving. So there'll be sort of jumbling, okay? I mean, overlapping, overlapping, so the, early parts, the late parts of the symbols are overlapped by other symbols, okay. So uh, there's, a, there's a problem because you're getting corrupted. 
the symbols are getting the symbol information is corrupted. Okay. The other symbol had different information and it is that is corrupted now. Uh, so the symbol is spreads out in time. Okay, you know, I mean every symbol is uh, I mean with its different fashion, it is sort of spreading out. Every symbol period is spreading out, okay. Because uh, but uh, well, these are all problems. We 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 need to explore the problem more. We need to look at the problem even from the sorry. Give me a second. We also need to understand the problem from. Uh, the frequency domain. Okay, from the time domain, we now understand. Okay. Now, in the frequency domain, uh, we can um, actually type of. Uh, we need to quantify the problem, the level of problem, because the environment has different types, and uh, so the level of problem will be different the type of problem will be different. So to quantify the problem, we, first of all, in the time domain, can uh, understand, can uh, uh, just uh, um, sort of articulate that if we have more delays, then it is more problematic. It is more dispersed. So it will be cause more interstable interference. So if the delays are more, of course, these values will be higher. The delay speed is higher. That's the problem for us. OK. Uh, so as you have uh, wider, OK, wider areas, uh, then you, uh, I mean, it's, it's a problem for us. OK. Now, uh, in the, if you characterize the channel, okay. let's assume that uh, the whole multipath environment, which is carrying the signal, we denote as a H, okay? And the signal that you transmit is shown as X. The signal you receive is denoted as Y. So X is what you are sending. It is going through H. And at the output end, you get Y, okay. Now, in the frequency domain, okay, the relationship is uh, very straightforward. If you have the characteristics uh, in frequency domain, okay, for, for all of them, if you have the characteristics, uh, then, uh, I mean, the, I mean, say you, you first have the instantaneous, uh, I mean, uh, expression for in the time domain for your signal X for X, you have some instantaneous equation, say A sine omega T, okay. For Y, you, you have got something. Similarly, the characteristic property of the environment uh, of the multipath channel is shown using some T, okay. So, you. I mean, you have, I mean, from the PDB, you actually try to define, you get a get an expression for your multipath channel. Okay, so, so that is the function of T. Okay, now this, this time functions, you can of course convert to frequency equivalent using Fourier transform. So if you get, them, sir. I didn't yeah. get this. Uh, this part. Time say, say the for, for say for x for the input signal is definitely clear that you have some time function. You can have some time function. You can have say a sine omega t, right? I mean the the signal that you are sending. Yes. Sir. It can be a sinusoid. So it's it's a sine omega t. Okay. Yes. Yes. Then then if you were transmitting via a communication path, uh, then, I mean, you are, uh, you can also define 
you can create an expression in the time domain how it is it is affecting uh, at different I mean at different times how uh, it is affecting the or I mean how it is behaving as a communication link so that is your ht okay so it, it will again be a time function now if you uh, want to get the output okay then the operation here is convolution then the operation here is is convolution uh, so sir, actually is the, ht is kind of like a filter where actually uh, uh, modeling is a, uh, modeling ht as a filter is it no, it's like uh, yeah, you can say like that. Yeah. By, by filter, actually, filter is a common theoretical representation. Okay. Mm -hmm. You, whenever you send something and it goes through a block, okay, block. and at the other end you receive something desired or or whatever, so this the uh, property of this block okay of course impact and that is you can consider it like a filter and the filter uh, i mean with filter equation you can actually treat okay so for now i mean this since it is uh, we are considering everything in time domain we have some time function okay however if you convert all these time functions into frequencies if you use Fourier transform to convert all of them, then you get, say, look at the um, lowest figure. So we are using capital terms there, XF and HF is the, is the bar that is taking the signal and YF is the output signal, okay? So you have, the signal component at different frequencies. Uh, and so at different frequency components, you have your input signal distributed, okay, at different frequency levels. The multipath channel is also shown this way. You have different components at different frequencies, okay. So around carrier frequency, you are interested in, I mean, of, I mean, your signal uh, is spread in the frequency domain around some carrier. So the carrier is shown here as FC. For your multipath channel, you also need to understand how these frequencies are uh, behaving. The multipath environment, okay. So when you convert the multipath environment time, you convert it into frequency, you get the, I mean, it will be an equation in terms of frequency that tells you how you get, when you put some particular frequency value there in the equation, in this H function, okay? I mean, just consider the capital H function. When you put a particular frequency value in this H function, you actually get the property Okay, some amplitude, some phase or whatever. You get the property at that particular phase. Okay, it will be actually a phaser, okay. Uh, well, a complex number, but you get, the, the bottom line is that you get the property of your multipath channel at that particular frequency. So at all different frequencies, you can find out the property of the multipath channel. The signal that you are sending, has also many different frequency components. Okay, if it, it is a composite, if it is a composite composite signal, carrying many different sinusoids. Okay, so all these frequency at all these frequencies, you have some amplitudes, so you get different frequency components. So you your signal will be affected by the frequencies. Okay, at at these different I mean, of your multipath channel, each of this frequent, if each of the frequency component of input will actually be, I mean, will face the amplitude of your multipath channel. Now, this HF is shown as a as a gain actually. Okay, I mean, I mean, you multiply 
your uh, age, val age value, and then you get what you uh, you uh, would get at the output. So meaning that what I want to mean, when you multiply x capital xf in an hf, you get yf. When you multiply xf and hf, you actually get how the different frequency components of your input signal are affected. Okay, I mean of course I mean different frequency each of the frequency components are affected by. For example, if you have some 22 megahertz input signal, okay, so that will be affected by your um, that will be affected by the multipath environment property at 20 megahertz. Once again, I mean you are sending a signal at 20 megahertz. I mean XF has a component. Uh, 20 mega, say 22 megahertz. Okay, so that will be, uh, I mean, uh, that will be treated by the property of the multipath environment. Okay, property at 20, 22 megahertz. Okay, so how it, how much it, it can be? Say it will be at this 22 megahertz. I mean, the path can be difficult. I mean, it can be the it, there can be loss of half of the power so then the gain is half of the signal or it can also change the phase okay uh, i mean so we are showing only the uh, impact of the amplitude okay or the magnitude but the phase is also affected so anyway so half of the so the gain is here half or the value of h is half okay, so for every frequency point you have certain gain the gain can be good or bad, whatever. Okay, now, if you have the gain as shown here, say, see the bandwidth of the signal, the whole bandwidth of the signal uh, is shown here around FC, okay? The input signal, the communication, the you use for in the communication link has certain, definitely. But whether you send some video signal or audio, whatever, it certainly has a particular bandwidth. So that particular bandwidth you <clears throat> you draw here, <clears throat> and you you have this many different different frequency components as shown. <clears throat> now at the other end, at the output end, you definitely want the same type of same pattern of frequency response. Okay, at the output end. Now, at the HF, you see, HF has the same value over the whole range of, of the bandwidth of the input. It has a flat level. At the top, it, had a, it has a wide flat level. Flat level means same value, same amplitude level for H. So it has a wide flat level around FC. So what would happen then? All the frequency components are equally affected on the way. So at the other end, at the receiving end, you get a replica of XF. The shape is the same. The shape is not distorted because all frequency components of input signal are equally affected on the way. Because the HF had this a flat level, same amplitude level over the whole frequency range of your input. So you get a replica, replica. So if you get a replica of your in in the frequency domain, I mean in the time domain, it will also be a replica of your input, meaning that your input signal is not distorted. Your input signal is not distorted. Now, in the time domain, the whole perspective is little difficult to explain because the equivalent, okay. I mean, here the relationship is, I mean, in the frequency domain, the relationship is x multiplied by h to get y. I mean, y equal to x into h in the frequency domain, y equals to x into f. So when it is a multiplication in frequency domain, in time domain, 
it becomes a convolution, which you know, I mean, you have to, the convolution is difficult to explain, but you have, I mean, you have to take different points and then add and uh, I mean, multiply and add. But anyway, the calculation is pretty long. Uh, but it's a, conv I mean, the term is convol convol the term convolution means complex. Very convoluted means very complex thing. So it is called com convolution because you have a complex calculation there. So it's not, um, but it will be a con convolution. Then to get y, y equal to xt, yt is equal to xt, convolution with yt. Now, in that case, uh, it's also, uh, okay, but we, well, what time is it? What time is it? So 10.30. It's already 10.30. Okay, so uh, I'll come back here the next day, but, but just allow me two minutes. You probably remember the time frequency conversion when you convert from time to <laughs> frequency. If you have, have an impulse or something narrow in time, in the frequency domain, you get wide. Straight, yes, a straight line. Right. If you have wide, okay, just a sinusoid. Then, if in the frequency you get a narrow, just a just a single single component. Okay. Yes. So the wider, so it's it's opposite. Now, in this case, see your HF, your HF needs to be wide, so that the whole XF fits in. XF. If you look at uh, our, I mean XF. I mean this um, good condition. It is not distorted. How we get that? XF is narrow. X is narrow, and H is wide. To actually take the whole X, then it is possible that your Y would be actually uh, the same. It's not distorted. Yes. On the other hand. Uh, I mean, this whole thing in the time domain, we can show this way. If it is wide in frequency, H, let's consider H. If it is wide in frequency, in time domain, it will be narrow. Okay. And X is narrow here. So in time domain, it is wide. Wide means actually the symbol period is long. Symbol period is long. So when your symbol period is long, in frequency, it will be narrow. Okay. So it is, in time, it is long. It is spatial, it's longer for your input. And in time, uh, the H is narrow, okay? So if that is the case in time domain, then it is good, it's a good condition because the same frequency, good, the same good condition, we're looking at in time domain, okay? So although, I mean, it might seem that, well, it is not fitting in, but at, you're doing convolution. So at the output end, you see that the symbol is pretty much the same. It is not distorted much. Like almost the same thing you get. You have get yt and xt looks pretty much the same. Okay, please allow me just two more minutes. This slide I'll just, I mean, show you today. I mean, I'll take one or two minutes, but uh, I'll come back here uh, to make sure the next day to make sure that you clearly understand. So here you see, you look at the bad condition. Look at the um, figure below. The bottom figure has now X, XF wide, HF narrow. So in that case, what, you, what would happen? The flat part is very, sm very small. So only that small part of your X will undergo, um, I, mean, a, I mean, good transformation. It will be unchanged that part of XF, when you multiply with, with H, H amplitude levels, as you multiply every component of X, you multiply it with a, X, every component of H, okay? So that part remain answered, very small part. But at the rest part, you have actually sharp fall. You have smaller gain values, smaller and smaller gain values. When you multiply, okay, it will be, they will fall, they, will, they won't keep the same values of X after multiplication. So YF would have actually different shape because I mean, I mean, they're, they're the, I mean, the gain values are small, smaller and smaller. 
so you have an, so now yf is different yf is different means it is distorted so in time domain x i mean x will be narrow h will be wide and the symbol will be distorted not like what you sent okay so this is the bad condition so we, i mean the condition to to try to as a the rf engineer needs to quantify how the condition is of the, uh, the condition of the environment multipath environment how good it is or how bad it is so the two extreme levels we are showing okay so good and to explain uh, i mean um, actually to differentiate the good and bad conditions okay uh, so it's uh, i'm sorry uh, i've taken uh, a few minutes more uh, so we'll come back here do you have any questions now no sir no sir so far. okay even when uh, we take class in the morning it seems like some of you have fallen asleep so at, <laughs> at this late night i don't know how many of you are in the okay. mm. and if you have good... to be here sir yes sir yeah okay okay thank you very much Sir, thank you, thank sir. You You're for taking the class from the hospital, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Each month of okay. Yes, I'm. Right. It's okay. Really I'm not. Appreciated. I am not disturbing my mom. She, she's on the other side. <laughs> on the base. Alhamdulillah. This is the attendant so side. She's so alhamdulillah. You, she's a lot better. A lot better now. Okay. Uh, I mean, she had. I mean, hard, with hard blocks, you know, people feel chest. Pain. So she had chest pain, but uh, after the stenting, from the left she's doing. I mean, she also had some breathing problem. But we thought earlier that it was a problem with respiration, mm -hmm. and so that is how her treatment is delayed. Okay, mm -hmm. we are we are not contacting cardiologist, uh, but it was uh, because of heart problem. Anyway, uh, so uh, I will talk to uh, the CR. The CR, sir. Yes. Yeah, and it's, well, I mean, in the morning, uh, actually, I cannot make it possible. So at some other time, inshallah. No problem, we'll sir. Take, yes, take sir. Inshallah, inshallah. Okay. Inshallah. Whenever you Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir, sir uh, will we have our lab, lab tomorrow? Oh, actually, we I I wanted to take the lab class tomorrow. And... Um, so we can hold and it, sir. No problem. We can hold it for now. Sir. Yes, sir. We can hold it for now. Like uh, we can do consecutive two weeks, sir, if needed. Like since tomorrow is inconvenient for you, sir. So okay. rather not um, push you. I, sir. Okay, yes, sir. I I will. We we are all prepared for our class for the next class. Okay, sir. And uh, okay, sir. so so we uh, I'll talk to the CRs if we can manage time. The CRs. Yeah, we'll we'll do that. Inshallah. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay. Sir. Inshallah. Inshallah. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum, sir. Assalamualaikum.